Um, recently, I took my kids fishing. Now, you have to understand that I'm not a very good fishing person. Uh, I've done it a little bit here and there, uh, but I'm not that great at it, not that experienced. But I felt like, okay, you know, you want to be a good dad and you got to do those things. So let's go. Let's try, guys. Okay, and the summer's ending, so let's try it. So that day, we went to Dick's Sporting Goods. We went up there. We bought some basic poles, fishing poles, blue one and a red one, right? We bought weights. We bought these little hooks, a little starter set for kids that's good, a little, little tackle box. And then at Dick's Sporting Goods, you can actually even buy worms. There's a refrigerator inside there that you can buy the worms. And so we bought all these things, got into our car, and then we drove over to this little lake that's in Middleton, not far from here. And so it was a, it was a beautiful day, you know? Uh, summer is ending. This is just a month ago. Summer is going to be ending, so we wanted to take the opportunity to get outside and enjoy the weather, and I can check off that I took my kids fishing, you know, uh, doing all that, you know. Um, we spent some time there, and as you can see, we caught some huge fish, right? <laughs> I mean, huge, like gigantic, right? Um, you know, as you look at this picture, you know, even though the fish we caught were so small, we caught many of these, the reason that I went to this lake in Middleton, I, I called someone from our church who knows about fishing, and I said, where can I go, where can we go that's like guaranteed, you know, guaranteed that you'll catch something because I don't want to be that dad, oh, we went fishing, we went okay. I, I, I want like success, you know. So where can we go, it's guaranteed. And so they said, well, you go to this place in Middleton, you stand on the dock, you look down, you can basically see like these little fish swimming all around. And so you put a worm on the hook, you drop it in, and pretty much right away, something's going to try to bite it, you know. Sometimes the fish are so small, they can't even bite the hook because the hook's too big, you know. But you get something. So I wanted to go to a place like that because I wanted the kids to experience that feeling. You know that feeling, if you've fished before, that feeling when something bites on the line, your bobber goes down underwater, you feel that in your pole, you know that feeling? I want them to experience that feeling because I remember that feeling growing up when I went fishing and that feeling makes me think, once in a while, I wouldn't mind that feeling again and I wouldn't mind trying again. So I wanted them to experience the joy of that feeling and that exhilaration, that excitement of catching the fish. You know, when you're in a situation like this, if your parents, you'll understand. If your parents, you'll understand someday. But you got to do everything. Like they don't want to touch anything. They don't want to touch the worm. They don't want to touch the fish. So all they do is this. You know, this is all they do. And then I'm doing all the work. But we did it. Okay. But I wanted them to know that feeling. As we think about this passage, Jesus is going fishing for souls. He's going to teach. Fishermen, in this passage, the joy of catching a fish, like you see in this picture. There's no greater joy that moment, like, I got it. And that feeling of catching the fish is so good. So Jesus is teaching his guys, his disciples, his followers, what that is. That there's nothing greater in life than to be fishing for souls. And so today, we want to be reminded and we want to learn that there really is nothing greater in this life than to be part of what God is doing in fishing for the souls of men and women who are lost as sinners and who need to be caught up in His grace. And so that's what we're going to do today. We'd like to look at this passage thinking about these three things as fishers of men. So first of all, we're going to talk about how we are caught with the gospel, caught by the gospel, you could say. And then second, we'll talk about how then, that was passive, then actively we go forth and we catch with the gospel. We catch people with the gospel. And then third, we'll talk about what it means that in our life we are called to the gospel and what that means for us in our journey. Okay, so these three things. So first of all, let's talk about what it means to be caught with the gospel, caught by the gospel. Look at verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, 
proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time, remember that word, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So keep in mind that Mark's writing here, he is fast-paced. You know, as mentioned before, Mark is like, they say, the gospel on steroids. You know, when Mark's writing, he's just quickly writing everything down because remember, he wants to preserve a historical account because many of the early Christians were starting to die and he didn't want the stories about Jesus to be lost, so he's quickly writing down this account. And so when you look at verse 14... It quickly summarizes how John has been arrested, but he doesn't dwell there. Remember, Mark wants to get to Jesus as soon as possible because he's preserving this. So if we dwell, if we pause, and if we dwell on John for just a moment, we have to keep in mind that prophets of the Old Testament were all pointing forward to Jesus who is coming, as we've talked about many times. So John the Baptist, written about here in the New Testament, It's to show us that he's a transitional figure from the Old Testament to the New Testament. John is that transitional figure. John is the last of the Old Testament prophets. So even though he's written about in the pages of the New Testament, John is really like the Old Testament prophets, the last one, the last prophet before Jesus. The last prophet. I don't know if you're into Star Wars. I am. But there's this idea of the last Jedi, you know? Who's the last Jedi? Was it Luke Skywalker? Is it Rey? Is it this kid that's at the end of the last movie? Like he gets the broom to move to him and then there's the foreshadowing like he might be that last. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe you're at the books. I don't know though. There's the last Jedi. Well, in the story of the Bible, there is no debate. John the Baptist is the last prophet to come before Jesus arrives on the scene. So John the Baptist is straddling the Old Testament and the New Testament. He's straddling in between. He's a bridge from the Old to the New Testaments, preparing the way for the arrival of Jesus, finally, that all the prophets have been talking about. So when you look at verse 14 now, it skips ahead to where Jesus is no longer at the Jordan River. Remember, he was at the Jordan River getting baptized by John. But Jesus is no longer at the Jordan River, but he is now in this region known as Galilee. And he begins his ministry by preaching that the time is fulfilled in verse 15. Remember I said, remember the word time. The word time is very important. It comes from the Greek word, Kairos, kairos, and that just sounds cool, kairos, right? It's a kairos moment. So it refers to like a special moment or anointed time. It's like that kairos moment that you've been waiting for all of your life. And Jesus here is testifying that that kairos moment has finally come. Everything that all of the Old Testaments, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of these guys, John the Baptist, all of these guys were talking about, pointing forward to, saying would come, prophesying about, that time has come. That moment has come. Thousands of years of prophecy, that Kairos moment has now been fulfilled. Jesus also says, that the kingdom of God is at hand. This means that the kingdom of God is is near. It's, It's drawn near in our hands. It means Jesus has finally arrived. So King Jesus has come so that now that means that the kingdom, because Jesus, the king, kingdom, he's brought it, the kingdom has drawn near. So Jesus the King is inviting everyone to be part of this spiritual and invisible kingdom that is finally drawn near in this Kairos moment. So what is the message of this gospel that we are caught with? This message is a call to repent from living for yourself 
and believe in this Jesus Christ who has been spoken about throughout the ages through the prophecies. The message of the gospel is not a religious call. It's not a call to go sacrifice more at the altars. It's not a call to go and do more things. It's not a call to sacrifice these more animals and do all these religious rituals. The message of the gospel, it's about turning away from our sin and turning to the long-awaited Savior who has now come. And so we are caught as we recognize our need to repent and believe. To repent and believe in Jesus. We are caught in his grace. We are caught by him. We are rescued from the ocean of sin by Jesus, who is the great fisherman. But to be caught, what do we have to do? We just do what Jesus says. What does he say? Repent and believe. He says, repent and believe. This commentator named Lane says this, If repentance denotes that which one turns from, belief denotes that which one turns to, the gospel. Both verbs in Greek are present imperatives, meaning they're continuous. That is, they enjoin living in a condition of repentance and belief as opposed to momentary acts. So it's continuous. Repentance and belief cannot be applied to certain aspects of life, but not to others. Rather, they lay claim to the total allegiance of believers. So what he's saying is that it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just a momentary thing, but it's our whole life and who we are. It's repenting and believing. It's turning away from ourselves and our sin and our own dreams and our struggles and our lusts and our materialism. It's turning away from all these things, and it's turning and belief to Jesus, who is that long-awaited Messiah who has now come. What does it mean to be caught? What does it mean to be a Christian? It is to be rescued by his grace caught in his grace, in the nets of his grace, as we repent and we believe. We repent because we see our sinfulness. We believe because we always see our Savior who came so that we could be caught in his grace. Have you been caught? Have you been caught in his grace? I pray that you would not allow yourself to miss out in being caught in the nets of his grace. So then we talked about being caught with this gospel. Then we talk about now what it means to go and catch with the gospel or to catch with the gospel. Look at verse 16. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So it's helpful here to know a little bit about the Sea of Galilee to give us a context here. The Sea of Galilee, if you look in the scriptures and other places, it's also called different names like the Sea of Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias. It's all the same sea. So they say it was a huge lake, and hopefully I did my research correctly. If I'm wrong, you can blame Wikipedia, but hopefully um, I'm right. But it's a huge lake over... 60 square miles. Just to give some comparison, Lake Monona here is only just over five square miles. So it's much bigger than Lake Monona. And Lake Monona is a pretty big lake. But this is nothing compared to like Lake Michigan, which is 22,000 square miles. So it's, it's, it's a big lake, bigger than Lake Monona kind of lakes, but not like Great Lakes, you know, that size. So the Sea of Galilee, they say, had many towns and fishing villages on its shores all around. There was lots of fish. So lots of commerce centered around this lake. And the reason I mention this is because most likely when you look at Simon and Andrew in this passage, and these guys who are being called, they were probably fairly, I'm not for sure, but they were probably fairly successful in their careers as fishermen. They were Lots of fish. There was a market for that. 
So it's not like they were destitute and they had nothing else. They were hopeless. They were on the brink of poverty and they needed Jesus' help so they followed Jesus. No, they had options. They were making a good living as fishermen. So Jesus, with that context, he begins his public ministry. Remember just a few verses ago by preaching to the crowds, repent and believe. It was a public ministry of preaching, but now he continues his ministry What does he do? He personally, individually reaches out to these people. You know, ministry, I think, that we do involves public ministry. It's what we do here on Sundays. What I'm doing is I'm publicly preaching here. But our ministry must also involve personal ministry as we think about context in our life. Context where we rub shoulders like family group. Context like meeting your prayer partner. Context like your friends or your coworkers or your classmates. And these contexts where personal relationships can be built. So we need to have preaching and teaching public ministry. And as I've said many times now, I believe that's essential, but I don't believe that's sufficient. So we need to have personal aspects of ministry in our life, family group, engaging with people, meeting people, prayer partners, different things where we engage more face-to-face. So Jesus' ministry is public and it's personal. Jesus' personal ministry is beginning here as he sees these two brothers, Simon and Andrew. Now, in case you're wondering, yes, Simon is Peter. Later, he'll be called Peter. This is Simon Peter, in case you're wondering. So here's Simon and Andrew, and what are they doing here? They're going to work, just like they probably do every single day. Fishing was their job. Fishing was their career, just like there's some people here who might be computer programmers. Some people might be involved in teaching. Some people might be in the medical profession. Some people are students studying, and that's your job for now. These guys are fishermen, and they're going to work. And so what does Jesus do in his personal ministry? He doesn't just preach and wait for them to come, but Jesus goes to them. He goes to their office. In fact, they have an office boat, and he goes to their office to engage with them. Mark's account doesn't give us a lot of detail concerning this scene, how Jesus personally reaches out to them. Remember, Mark is like fast-paced, right? He just wants to get it down, but... Luke, who writes later on, Luke reads Mark's stuff, and then he takes some of it, uses some of it, gets more information, and then Luke is a doctor. So Luke writes more descriptively. So in order to understand this passage, it's helpful to understand and see the other synoptic gospel and see what Luke says in chapter 5 when he writes about this scene. This is what Luke writes. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish. Verse 8. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So think about Simon, the professional fisherman, had toiled all night long, meaning they were all there, out there all night trying to fish, and there were no fish to be caught. They know there's no fish to be caught. And Jesus shows up and tells them, hey, why don't you just, I know it's morning, but why don't you just try letting down the nets one more time? It doesn't make sense because you don't do that in the morning. It's a thing that you do overnight. Now, I'm not sure why Simon listens to Jesus, it doesn't make sense to me because it's it's like some people who work in computer software and let's say I'm a pastor and I go to your office and I say, you know, I think you should change the code right there. I I don't know anything about coding. I usually change the code right there and they would look at me like, go read your Bible, you know, go back to church, right? I don't know what to tell them, but think about this scene. Simon is a fisherman all of his life. Jesus It's a carpenter. They don't even know each other. 
So why does Simon listen to Jesus? I just have no idea. Maybe, maybe Simon had heard rumors about what just happened in the previous passage when Jesus got baptized. Sky opened up. God's voice was heard saying, this is my son whom I love and I'm well pleased. I'm sure news like that got around. So Simon, we're not sure why he listens, but as he does this, he does what Jesus says, and they have a miraculous catch of fish to the point that Simon is overwhelmed and starts to see this man, Jesus, differently. He starts to see that this might be the Son of God that maybe I've heard about. He starts to see holiness before him. He starts to see that this is the Son of God holy before me. And then he says, I'm a sinful man. Woe to me. He's basically saying, I should die right now. It's kind of like that feeling like, let's say you were at Harvest Games and you're running around all day. Let's just say it was warmer and you're sweating more. And then instead of going home and showering, you go straight to like a really nice restaurant downtown. Just as you are. You walk in and everybody's well-dressed and clean and groomed. And suddenly at Harvest Games, you look fine, you know, eating a bologna sandwich. It was great, you know, but you go to this fine dining restaurant and then you'll feel so dirty, right? You'll feel out of place. Simon feels that filth and he sees himself and he says, I should die before your presence. So Simon here declaring his sinfulness. What is he doing? He's repenting and believing. Repenting and believing. Simon Peter was caught by Jesus because he was realizing that I'm a sinner who needs to repent. And he's caught realizing that there's a Savior in front of me in which I can believe. Repenting and believing. That's what it's about. So Jesus says to Simon and to Andrew, his brother, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So These career fishermen are now caught by Jesus, but then these career fishermen are told to go and catch others as fishers of men. And notice what happens. Immediately, there's no thinking about it. There's no, like, give me a minute here. There's nothing like that. Immediately, they drop their nets to follow Jesus, and to go and become fishers of men. I think about what's going on here. Jesus could easily have done all the catching of sinners in this world by himself with the snap of his fingers. But his desire is for those who are caught to be the ones who would go and catch You know, if you are here, and if you're in Christ, you've been caught. Jesus wants us to experience the joy now of catching others with the irresistible bait of his grace. I don't know for you, but there's been a few times in my life when I experienced this a little bit. I remember one time sitting with this person and just sharing with them. They didn't know much about church. They didn't know much about Christ. But sharing with them just my story. I didn't even know how to explain it fully. I was pretty young in my faith, but I just started sharing my story and how Jesus had saved me and how I came to know his love and how I love him. And I didn't know all the answers, but I just kept sharing and telling him that I believe God loves him and God died for him and God cares for him. God is with him and all these things. And you know what? I remember this guy... Tears starting to run down his eyes. And all of a sudden, he was so overwhelmed by this incredible sense of God's unconditional love. And I remember that moment, the joy that came on his face. But you know what? I experienced an incredible joy because I got to experience what it means to fish. And I got to experience that joy. That's what Jesus wants. He models for us to go where people are. He gave us the example to help them to see their own sinfulness, 
but also to help them see the grace of a Savior who loves them. He modeled for us what it means to be a fisher of men so that now we can go and engage people and be fishers of men. I am here today because when I was a freshman, there were some guys in my family group that I went to just because I wanted to play basketball with them, but I went to this family group and ate noodles with them late at night and did all kinds of things. And in that year... I am here today because they were fishing for my soul. If you are caught in Christ and you're here, there was someone in your life who went fishing for your soul at some point in your life. It might have been a pastor. It might have been your parents. It might have been some friend in school. But there was someone who went fishing for you. Now Jesus desires for all who are caught to follow his example and go fishing for men and women who need his grace. It's a fishing expedition that you will not fail in because once people get a taste of the bait, which is his grace, it is irresistible. So can I ask you, is there someone in your life that you need to go fishing for? Someone that has toiled all night in their life, but keeps coming up empty. Someone who is fishing in this world for all kinds of stuff, thinking that these things that they catch in the world will satisfy. Someone who is hurting, desperately in need of discovering God's love for them. I pray that we, if we are caught, we would go and experience the joy of fishing. He wants us to experience that. You know, Apostle Paul was addicted to fishing. He writes in Romans 10, it's not on the screen, let me read it to you. He writes this. He says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And Paul is saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How beautiful it is when we are sent and we go fishing for the souls of people. And we experience that joy. And it's what he was addicted to. And it's what he loved. He wants us to experience. So we are sent to go to people, to preach to them, to love them, to share the gospel, and to catch souls. This is how they can believe. This is the ministry of being sent as fishers of men. Oh, I pray that we would learn what it means to have joy, anticipation, excitement, addiction to fishing and that joy that Jesus wants us to experience. So we talked about, first, how we are caught by this gospel. Second, we talked about how now we are to go and catch with this gospel. Finally, we want to talk about this idea of how we are called to live our lives, our life for this gospel. Look at verse 18. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Jesus is always seeking out guys who are brothers, sir, who were in their boat mending their nets. Verse 20. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So we see with Simon and Andrew, now we see with James and John, that they immediately followed Jesus when Jesus went fishing for them. Here in verse 20, we see these brothers, James and John, what do they do? Immediately they leave and they too follow Jesus, but notice Notice there's something different here. They not only leave their fishing gear, but they leave behind their father named Zebedee in the boat. Now, I have to ask a question here. Does this mean that they were abandoning their father? Their father who taught them fishing all of their life? Like in those days, you know, if you're the son of a carpenter... You became a carpenter. If you're a son of a blacksmith, you became a blacksmith. If you're a son of a fisherman, you became a fisherman. 
Does this mean that they're abandoning Zebedee, their father? I don't think so. Instead, I think the point here is that when Jesus comes, they see how in living for Jesus as a fisher of men, that there is something much bigger than themselves, bigger than their family, bigger than their family business, something more eternal, something more worth living for. Maybe as a family, they had a family business in fishing, and their father Zebedee had plans for them. Who knows? It's not that they are forsaking their earthly father Zebedee. They still love him. They are still to honor him. They are still to care for him, still to provide for him if needed. But they are called now to be a part of their heavenly father's plans. I think rather here it's a matter of them discovering that God has a different plan, a bigger plan for them in a heavenly way, their heavenly father. So Jesus is calling them to be part of this gospel ministry, and this gospel work in this way. He's calling them to something bigger, more valuable, more satisfying than this world can afford or offer. It's a life he's calling them to live with a single-minded purpose of knowing Jesus and making Jesus known, being caught and catching men and women who are sinners lost without him. When I read this passage, it reminded me so much of one of my favorite Bible passages, which is from Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is about this pearl merchant, verse 45, 46. And this pearl merchant, he's the searcher of fine pearls in this world. And so he's traveled the world and he's seen pearl after pearl after pearl. He's seen the most beautiful pearls that the world has to offer. But then suddenly one day, he comes across this particular pearl and he's gazing at it because he's never seen a pearl so lustrous, so beautiful, so magnificent. He's just gazing and staring at this pearl. And he thinks to himself, I got to have this pearl. I've never seen something so beautiful and so wonderful. If I could just have this pearl and all of a sudden all the other pearls that he treasured, they weren't as important as having this pearl. And so what is he willing to do? He's willing to sell all of these other pearls in order to be able to obtain and to gain this one pearl. And when he finds this one pearl, he holds it. He's satisfied. He loves it because this is the pearl that he's been looking for all of his life and he has finally found it. And this story of the pearl merchant is really the story of our lives. We go around looking from pearl to pearl. Will this satisfy? Will this be it? Is this the pearl that I need? And all these pearls seem to promise something, but they never fully satisfy. And none of them are necessarily bad. Many of them are good things in our life. But ultimately, it's only Jesus as the pearl that truly satisfies. Everything in our life becomes secondary when we see the greatness of Jesus as our great pearl. That's the gospel. I think that's what's happening to these fishermen. They're realizing that here before me is what I've been looking for all of my life, and now they're willing and wanting to follow Jesus because there's nothing that compares Oh, I pray. If you don't feel like that about Jesus, we have not yet seen Jesus enough. I pray that you would see more and more of Jesus, that you would want to live according to his call in your life because he is your pearl that you've been looking for. So as you think about this passage, we talked about how we are caught With the gospel, Jesus catches us, repent and believe. And then what do we do? We go to others. We help to catch others who are lost, dying in the the ocean ocean of sin. We catch them. We help them to repent and believe. And then all through that, we're reminded that, man, I've been caught. 
Oh, I've been caught by his grace. I've experienced the pearl that I've been looking for all of my life. There's nothing better. There's nothing worth living for but him. And Jesus, I'll follow you. Again, if we don't feel like that, just keep looking at him. Keep seeing Jesus. Keep learning more about him. Falling in love with him. And that we want to live according to this calling, no matter what it costs. Let me uh, close with this quick story. Uh, as many of you know, I grew up in, in uh, Minneapolis most, for most of my life, Twin Cities, until I went away to college. Uh, during my high school years, uh, our family would often go to this little town in northern Wisconsin called Hayward. It's about a three-hour drive from Minneapolis. And the town of Hayward is known for a big fish that people try to catch there called the muskie. Hayward is actually considered the musky capital of the world. They have a musky museum there, and I've been there. <laughs> um, people catch incredible fish, and you see these pictures all over the place. This kind of picture is very common there. So our family was at this cabin for a weekend, little cabin on the lake with a little motorboat. And so one morning by myself, I went out on the boat, and I decided I'm going to try fishing. And I don't know that much about fishing, but I'm going to try it. And so I go out there by myself just a little bit. And so I put the lure on the line and the lure is like a big plastic fish with hooks all over it. I tie it up and I throw it out there. A few moments later, I suddenly feel this tremendous pull. It's unlike any pull of a fish I've ever felt before. I mean, in the beginning, I showed you the kind of fish I'm used to catching. That's all I know. So I've never felt pulled like this before. So here I am. I'm fighting the strength of this great musky fish. And the pole is bent like, you know, like a U or like a C shape. The pole is bent. And I'm fighting this fish, trying to pull it in. I'm reeling it in. And finally, I get the great musky, probably world record musky, I, pro I get it really close to the boat. Okay? It's right there. I can see it. I can almost grab it with my hands. But you have to remember, I'm holding on to this pole, two hands. I'm by myself, so there's no buddy to like, reach a net in there and grab it for me. So I'm on my own. So I got to get this world record muskie. I got to get it out of the water and into my little boat, probably... With that muskie and with me, we're going to sink. But together, we're in, we gotta get it, we got to get in the boat. Okay? And so what happened? At this moment, I'm holding on. I'm right there. I can see the fish. Thoughts are racing through my mind. I'm thinking, oh, trophy fish on my office wall forever. I'm thinking pictures like that guy to post online for the world to see. I'm thinking bigger fish than my brother, the fisherman, has ever caught. I'm thinking Korean spicy fish stew tonight. You know, I'm having all these thoughts. So at that moment, when I'm about to put the fish into the boat, the unthinkable happens. The line snaps, and the fish swim away. Ah! As I see the fish going deeper into the water, I almost wanted to jump in and get out. You know? Oh. I was so close about to pull this fish, my heart sank, so I headed back to shore with nothing to tell my family but a story about how that fish got away. You know, that day, I tried to catch that fish, but I failed. I'm not a very good fisherman, but when we think about Jesus, he is the great fisher of men and women. When he goes fishing, no one gets away. Can I say, he wants to use you if you're caught. He wants to use you to catch sinful men and women who need to be caught with the hope of the gospel. As we're caught, he wants us to catch. And it's the great privilege to which we are called. Some of us today are here. We love you. We're glad that you're here. But you still need to be caught. 
you see the hope of this gospel that Jesus offers to you. If you are here, I don't believe it's by accident or coincidence. I have my own story. and When I went to church, I look back, it was not accident or coincidence. Jesus is fishing for you. He loves you too much that he will never let you go. Some of us here today, we need to start catching because we've been caught. Do you see the hope of the gospel that Jesus is offering to those all around you every single day? Is there someone that you're praying, Lord, help me to catch this person in your love? Jesus wants to use you and I. Jesus wants to use you to be a fisher of sinful men and women in your classrooms, in your workplaces, in your realms of life. Be a fisher so that these people, that person that you can pray for, would know the hope of the gospel and be rescued and saved. Oh, I pray that through our church, we be on a fishing trip that we can never fail in together. And many people would have stories of how they were caught and they became catchers of men and women through our church. Let's pray together.